Puck converters are circuits designed with a very specific purpose, to reduce voltage levels without wasting power. Because of their switching mode operation, they don't need to dissipate excess energy to regulate, making them far more efficient than traditional LDOs. Their ideal equation is simple to understand, but in practice, real buck converters are more complex than that and even this equation doesn't always hold true. So in this video, let's explore 4 practical limitations of buck converters and how to overcome them like a pro. Typical buck converters are made of a MOSFET, a diode, an inductor and a capacitor with a voltage input and a load. While LTOs rely on the linear mode of transistors to create a constant voltage drop, buck converters alternate the switch between fully on or off. When the switch is on, energy is transferred from the input to the load and also stored on the magnetic field of the inductor. When the switch is off, no energy flows from the input and the inductor provides its stored energy to the load. By quickly alternating the switch between on and off with a PWM signal and a certain ratio, energy is transferred from the input to the output in chunks. Instead of dissipated, the excess energy flowing on the on state is stored on the inductor and delivered to the load during the off state. This averaging effect can be seen on the ideal equation of buck converters. But as you may know by now, nothing is really ideal. Losses will impact the buck's equation, but are limited to the non-idealities of the components and are typically lower than 10%. The biggest change on a buck's equation comes from its different operating modes. In steady state, a buck is operating in CCM if the inductor never fully discharges, which can be seen on its current ripple. But if the inductor's current reaches zero within a switching period, it is then operating in DCM and several new dependencies appear on its equation. This happens because the average current supplied to the load now depends also on a third switching phase, when no energy is provided by the inductor. The length of this phase depends on other variables, which increases the complexity of the equation. Now, bugs can save your life, but just if you know how to use them. One of the biggest limitations of traditional buck converters is unidirectionality. In many applications, the load is not a resistor. It may store or generate energy, like a battery or a DC motor. Instead of using a separate converter to recover the load's energy, you can use a bidirectional buck converter, which can transfer power in both directions. In a traditional buck, this is not possible, as the diode can only conduct current in one direction. But if you exchange this diode with another MOSFET, you get a bidirectional synchronous buck. This happens because you can now drive the new MOSFET to store energy from the output on the inductor and then deliver it to the input. From the load's perspective, it works like a synchronous boost converter, which does exactly the opposite of a buck. A second limitation to consider are switching frequencies. Increasing the switching frequency is one way of reducing the size of inductors and capacitors, as both current and voltage ripples are inversely proportional to it. But still, most buck converters operate within 100 kHz to 1 MHz, with only a few designed to operate properly above this limit. This happens because, while a higher switching frequency helps reducing inductance and capacitance values, it also increases overall losses of the buck. Some of these effects include skin effect, proximity effect, core losses, MOSFET switching losses, and the reverse recovery of diodes. Above a certain frequency, savings on component size have to be compensated by heat sinks, which defeats the purpose of miniaturization. On top of that, switching also creates voltage ripples. In certain buck applications, voltage ripples have to be very small. The amplitude of the voltage ripple depends on the capacitor's value, as well as the frequency and amplitude of its current. Because increasing the switching frequency impacts efficiency, there is a limit to the ripple that can be achieved on bucks with a certain size. In this case, you can use interleaving. This technique consists in using two or more buck converters in parallel, each with half of the power rating and same switching frequency. By switching the converters with a phase shift, the sum of the current ripples will partially cancel each other. This results in current frequencies being multiplied by two, while their amplitude is reduced to a fraction of the original one. With this, losses due to the switching are kept low, while the requirement on output capacitance are greatly reduced. But one of the most well-known issues with buck converters is dealing with high step-down ratios. When ratios get too high, buck converters tend to enter DCM mode unless the inductor has a high value. In this case, they either lose efficiency or get bulky. In DCM, losses on the MOSFET increase as current peaks are higher than in CCM for the same output current. To keep CCM, the inductor needs to be rated with a high value and support high currents without reaching saturation, which also increases its overall volume and costs. On top of that, high ratios require a very low duty cycle, which is harder to achieve and make the control of the buck more unstable. The most common way to handle high ratios is to use a transformer-based topology. These topologies are based on the buck and have a similar equation, which includes the turns ratio as a further design variable. With that, the duty cycle can be kept at a moderate value with gains in efficiency and size. In the end, there are many ways of working around the limitations of a buck converter. You just have to know which one works best for you. If you liked this video, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to my channel for future videos. Thank you for watching and see you next time on Microprocessed.